Uh, okay, I want to try for sure, but my PC is a potato. Uh, Alright, so... This is a, it's a video about, uh, just a quick video, hopefully, you know, a quick video for me means an hour long usually, so just get ready. But, what's the difference between WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and a virtual machine? And we've, we've talked about this before, but I want to specifically talk about what is the best pick for a beginner, uh, specific, specifically since WSL 2 just came out. Um, and I'm going to tell you some of my impressions, but I'm, I'm mostly opening this conversation up so that we can have uh, people... Uh, you know, discuss it uh, respectfully, uh, and and all the implications of it, including uh, that sometimes it doesn't work with other technologies. Um, so first of all, what is a virtual machine? Uh, I may or may not have covered that in other videos, but here's what one looks like. So I'm running, as you know, I'm running Linux Mint now on this system. I've been running it forever. There's no reason to change. It's just stable. It's a great streaming system. Uh, and now that you know, uh, now that you know, Mint is going with Debian. Uh, based distro. I'm even more inclined to use them because I'm a I'm a big advocate of Debian based distros for stable systems that need to work no matter what uh, and you know that kind of thing. Uh, however, uh, sometimes having a virtual machine is nice because you can try out everything else uh, in, including and so I want to show you a couple this is something called VirtualBox. Uh, you can go download VirtualBox and install it on Windows, Mac or uh, Linux, uh, although there are other options there. We're not going to talk about all the options right now. This is just hands down the most popular option for this kind of thing, even though there might be better options depending on your needs. Uh, but this is definitely the most popular. So you download a tool from Oracle who bought VirtualBox, by the way, and, and that says a lot, by the way, because it's, it's a really good technology, unlike pretty much anything else from Oracle. Um, and, I mean, forget it, I said that. <laughs> so you go to get VirtualBox and then you start it up and you can um, have it when you create a new one. You can go look for uh, the virtual machine. And I'm just going to show you. So you go find, like I have Windows 10 in here. You can run another Pop! OS install. Uh, and then you can go put your virtual machine in a file, basically. Uh, switch this out. I'm not going to do it all right now. I'll do that on another stream. Uh, but you can, and then you can go, you know, fire it up. And... Once you do all of that and go through the settings, and that's its own video, as I said, you have to go through that. We might do that today later. Uh, then you get something you can run. So these are, when you run these and, and they freeze, uh, VirtualBox is really easy to use. It really is. And we're gonna, and there's lots of YouTube videos on this probably, so I don't need to cover it. So this is my running Pop! OS uh, installation uh, in a virtual machine. I got a pretty beefy system here. It's not, you know, it's an MSI uh, tower for gaming. Uh, just a you know run of the mill tower I bought Best Buy. Uh, not not ashamed of, to say that I built hundreds of machines. I don't need to build you know this particular one. I've got lots of room to build if I want to add more to it. Uh, but this is the biggest uh, uh, question. So you know GSF says here I wanted to try it, but for sure my PC is a potato. So the biggest disadvantage of running a virtual machine is you have to have a pretty beefy computer. Uh, you at least have to have you know four cores because you're going to give up one of your CPU cores to or at least one, maybe two, to your virtual machine while it's running. And you're also going to allocate a certain amount of RAM, the memory, uh, and you know a little bit of disk too. So if you have like a really tiny SSD, which some people might still have, uh, this is probably not your best your your best option. But it's still required for most technologists uh, beyond a certain level because this is how you try out other operating systems. This is how you start up Windows. Uh, and I have another one. I'm probably crash my same machine to run them both at the same time. But this is how you can run and try out Windows uh, and Pop! OS and things like that. If, and if I have time, I'll show you the Windows one that I have running as well. Uh, and so, yeah. So this is, it, it steals the keyboard and everything. So I can push, you know, the command key. This is Pop! Pop! OS is very much a, a, an operating system for people who don't want any trouble, who just want it to look relatively pretty and clean, uh, who kind of want a Mac and a Windows experience, but have Linux to use underneath the hood. And some Unix users, I mean, and Linux users really hate that. Uh, you know, and I usually recommend Gen 2, Arch, or LFS. As I've said before, there's three types of cultures. Uh, there's kind of subgroup cultures in the Linux community. There's the edgy people who think everybody else is plebs. Uh, there's the mainstream people who just want it to work and want an alternative to Windows and, 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 um, and Mac. Uh, and then there's the corporate people who want to make money off 
of deploying this free software in their enterprise in a different way, like usually server side people. And you can there's so you just kind of have to position yourself in that camp. Um, and you can still be an edgy user and not an, an asshole. <laughs> just by the way, so you know you can still be an arch user or uh, you know and and go ahead and support those people who are just starting out. And that's why I recommend Pop OS. I've done that in another video. I talked about why these, this is a distro I pick uh, to recommend to beginners. I used to, I, I still recommend Mint. Mint is still really good too, particularly now it's going to Debian. Uh, but for the most beginners, and I'm talking about people that I've worked with in the, you know, the, the 11 to 16 age range, a lot of them sometimes, they, they generally respond best to Pop OS because they've done a lot of, System76 has done a lot of good uh, to smooth over the, the some of the bumps along the way. Just, and so that's what's going on. But this debate is really about, it's not really a debate, but I'm really asking the question, should we use WSL or a virtual machine? Uh, again, if you got a WSL, you can pop up a terminal. Uh, you can trans, you can color the terminal. It's a GNOME term, of course. Uh, so you can turn on transparency. Uh, you know, you can do whatever. Uh, so if you wanted to get, you know, like an old school terminal, where's my X term? Uh, I, I used to be a big Solarize guy too. <clears throat> Solarize. Uh, if you like Solarize, by the way, uh, so bold takes some bright colors. Nope. Um, let's go to Solarize. Solarize Dark. Oh, good old Solarize Dark. I love that it's a standard one now. This makes me this makes me a little nostalgic. Uh, I used to code on Solarize Dark all day, every day. As you can tell, it's not a very good uh, color scheme for streaming. It's not doesn't have very good uh, contrast, and so it's not the one that that I use. My point is is that you can mess mess with it. Uh, and including doing things like transparency. So I'm, I'm kind of stating one of the advantages of virtual machines right now. Uh, so colors, you can go in and say, I want to have like black on white, uh, white on black, sorry. And I want, what color scheme do I want? Do I want use transparency background? Uh, I want full transparency. Can I do that? Use transparent background? Yes, full transparency. Remember, you can actually make it kind of like mine if you want. You can't change it from the command line uh, like you can with Alacrity, which you can also run on here. Um, but let's say I want to use uh, Xterm. And uh, so what I'm getting at is that you can do things uh, with... Uh, so let me full screen this. I wonder if F11 will be caught. It is. So look at that. There you go, guys. <laughs> so let's see. Yep, you can you can uppercase it. You can do all the same things that you know that I've been doing, uh, the C matrix and stuff. My point is is that when you use a virtual machine, you get a full computer experience. That means if you want to make your terminal look pretty uh, and have transparent background, all that stuff, you have more options because it's a full system. You know, you can do the searches. You can run Firefox from within your virtual machine and here's here's the other big advantage when you're using a virtual machine you then are ready when it's time to move on and go to a hard drive uh so let's put those things down in a little bit of a if a let's put those those pluses and minuses pros and cons in a little bit of a file here vms as a safety thing at all purposes consolidation not security okay so um all right. I mean, I'm trying to think because you would still have to run an underlying VPN if you didn't want to dox your IP. You got that. Um, I consider it safer. So, Ramingu, I've heard it's used a lot in the security field. People will will make uh, they'll use a, a v, they'll use a, a if if somebody breaks out and you and they break into your system. See what I'm saying? If so, say you're you're doing you're doing you know some kind of thing while you're hacking. Uh, and if you actually get malware, it will only affect the, the virtual machine and not your raw, your core system. That's what I mean by safety. So maybe I should say sandbox, uh, sandbox uh, when combined with the VPN. I got to read all these great VMware security advisories. Uh, yes, and, and actually VirtualBox. So um, was it, uh, what's the, what's the competition they had in Seattle where they do poning? So VirtualBox has been pwned a lot of times too. Uh, things like that are a real threat. Yeah, people using VMware kind of stuff. Um, out of bounds related VMware hypervisors are reported in VMware. Yes, uh, this is actually um, 
it's related to uh, there's a the cyber war series. Uh, one of the episodes where Ben, the, the journalist, he was actually uh, given an award later for not giving up some of his sources. He uh, covered there's one episode where he covers a um, a a zero day competition and the top two zero day awards went to people who had found uh, zero day vulnerabilities in VMware and and, and sorry VirtualBox. So so using a VM. Uh, might be safer in, in sense of a sandbox, but you might actually be putting yourself at, in jeopardy in different ways that we don't even know about. So that's that's a really interesting context for all that conversation. Appreciate you bringing that up. A couple of little little topics here, uh, or, or Blastwave. Blastwave is Blastwave. All right, all right. Well, let's do that. Dennis Clark. Uh, Dennis Clark. Uh, yeah, Dennis Clark visit. Uh, and so. I'm going to, I'm going to try as you're going to, you're going to laugh. I know Dennis is going to laugh his ass off at this, but I'm going to try to summarize Solaris for everybody else out there and real, uh, really quickly. And I do want to do a, say just a quick little story. So once upon a time with Mr. Rob, uh, I actually worked at a company called teleport, uh, in Oregon. It was an internet service provider and I, and I, did I get it right? All right. And I, and I told him, uh, uh, they actually, I had learned Perl. So it's a long. I've told that story before, but I I was a Russian major, and yes, yes, the Russian говорят что люди здесь сегодня. Ну скажите, иногда иногда у нас русские люди русские говорящие. Anyway, so I was uh, I was a Russian major, and I'm just asking you. Yeah, there they are. Hey, how's it going, Ace? Hey, he did a really cool thing. You guys need to go see. Uh, how do you say your name? Asig's uh, video. Uh, yeah, he's definitely a legend. Ace, he did. Um, he did a he he wrote um a what what is what would you call it he wrote he wrote a, an application in go that goes or i don't want to overstate it that goes around and grabs all the um uh the local proxies it's a pro, he, like research goes through some proxies and does some some so we got a lot of good coders in the audience here anyway so i was a uh, proxy grabber yeah yeah i don't know why i was braining brain farting on that so so anyway i I can do one sentence thing. Solaris, there. See, there we have the from from the kernel coder's mouth. Solaris is an at t system V release five uh, port of the Unix to a commercial implementation with full SUV2 SUV spec compliance. Therefore, it is a good test bed for software compliance. All right. Uh, in in newbie speak, <laughs> it's a it's another version of Unix out there uh, that uh, came out, and I I my a son actually came from Stanford, from what I understand. Uh, the Stanford University Network. That's what son stood for. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Uh, and by the way, this is one of the reasons that I would go to Stanford if I were to ever teach or attend a school. Stanford keeps standing out to me for some reason. Uh, but primarily, you can watch this in um, Triumph of the Nerds uh, 2.01. Uh, Stanford University Network. Yep. And and the guys at Sun, they and and this includes uh, the people who created 3Com, which then later on on to become, you know, Ethernet, which is what the Internet is based on. Again, this is all covered in a documentary called um, Triumph of the Nerds uh, 2.1. It was like about the invention of the Internet. It's really boring <laughs> compared to the other one. But anyway, they talk about it. And so Stanford University uh, allowed these guys who were doing this project, and I'm overly really summarizing what I saw summarized. Uh, and they they created they so they created this this new operating system that was really popular and it was really uh, adopted by a lot of people uh, because because it wasn't AT and T, which well, how much was AT and T in the day, Dennis? Do you remember? What is this? It, isn't AT and T Unix per seat still like in the hundreds of dollars? It's like crazy now. Uh, Sun slash Solaris is largely considered dead, right? Well, uh, not according to Dennis. <laughs> Dennis will tell you it's not dead. But uh, well, previous to Sun, I worked at SDI Unix. Oh no way, man! And the early Apollo systems. Were you around for the whole? Uh, were you around for the whole next box stuff? It didn't. Didn't he? Pretty Oracle is still making a billion dollars on it uh, on 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 Unix AT and T. Who got the SCO license, by the way? Who pulled that one out? Because I thought I thought Sco had had to hold on to all the original AT and T license stuff, didn't they? Before they died. I'm just trying to trying to put the date on that. Was it Novell? It was Novell, right? And I was in Provo about that time, uh, and I think no, I, Novell's still around too. I have to go check on that. I went to BYU. That was my university. So uh, anyway, so why why do you care about Stanford? Because Stanford let these guys do all this stuff and let them 
yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, word perfect, Novell bought Word Perfect too, and now they're all dead. Um, so, and that's all in that documentary too, by the way. I, so it's from what I understand from Stanford that let, they let people keep their IP. And that's something that's really interesting about a university. The university I went to, every single thought you had as a student belonged to the university. Uh, and so if you're interested in going to, if you're a technologist by heart and you haven't picked a college yet, make sure that, that you ask them about their IP policies because a lot of significant things are invented while you're in college. And, and if you, so I'm going to just put a little tack, thumbtack in this, uh, Twitch mark, uh, college IP. Um, and so I'm just gonna put a little mark in that because let me just say this again. So when you're preparing to go to college and you are, particularly if you're a smart technologist and you are bound to have really great ideas while you're in college, uh, you know, Linux kind of was a riff off Minix, which is what Linus Torvald's professor was all about. Um, uh, just make sure that your university that you're con contemplating going to uh, has a pretty liberal policy with IP. Uh, some of the universities you go to might say, you, you know, we own you kind of thing. And, you know, just be careful with that. Okay. And the reason this is coming up is because, as you can see in the title, we've been talking about Solaris and Stanford University, Stanford University Network Sun, which became Solaris. Uh, Stanford was a university as, as far as I understand, I've seen this on a documentary, uh, has a much more liberal policy with regard to, to IP, and they even let you start companies on the campus. Uh, that's, I thought that was relatively, you know, not a thing, like hard to find, that you would actually have a, an entire company and you could run it off their campus, use their campus systems, and then benefit from it. Uh, so as you're choosing a college, just make sure you pick a college that's not going to hold you back. Uh, the guys who created Novell, for example, uh, it's a different story. Um, I think some of them were there at Brigham Young University. Um, uh, but, but, but yeah, we'll talk about that another day. My point is just make sure you don't, you know, get yourself in a corner by going to a college that is going to own you. MIT, as I understand it, I haven't, I didn't go there, but MIT, as I understand it also allows you to have ownership of your own IP. So if you invent something really awesome, uh, you can take that where you, where you want to. Um, and that means you can release it as open source. You can be proprietary. It's up to you. I assure you these things. So Dennis says, I assure you of these things. Uh, are selling to banks and insurance and heavy industry. My Hyundai is a big customer in their offshore drilling rig operations. They are not porting their software anytime soon. Wow. So that's Solaris. Yeah. And that's not even technical debt. That's just something that works that they don't need to change. That's kind of the, what I, what I keep finding is the way BSD people look at the world. Uh, and um, I think it's still fair to say that BSD is the go-to pick uh, f uh, Oracle Spark. Wow. They still have Spark. Oh, that brings back some memories. So what is the, even is Solaris? Solaris is a version of Unix uh, that came out kind of in response to AT&T's Unix, uh, which is really the first one. And you can watch a really fun video on that if you want to go find that on YouTube, uh, where they're actually introducing the world to, 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 um, <clears throat> to Unix. <clears throat> and they actually say, uh, one of the guys, I think it's, I think it's actually uh, Keith Thompson. Uh, it's either Richie or Thompson, I don't remember. But he actually says, and so this, so we created the high level C language. <laughs> he actually says high level C language because, you know, the original operating Unix operating system was written in assembly. Uh, and then they wrote C, they created C uh, to finish the Unix operating system. So they re-implemented it uh, and, 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 you know, in C, which is why you should still learn C. I'm sure Dennis has great, great opinions on why you should learn C. Uh, it's great that we have Dennis and, and El Ramingo next to each other because Ramingo is the one who convinced me to go back to teaching C to beginners uh, at, a, at, a, at an easy level so they could come to understand the computer and how it works uh, better at the lower level. <clears throat> Lycan, good to see you. Uh, I see Spark and think of it and think of the server that my work just finally got rid of about two years ago. And old Alpha Spark was horrible to find parts for. <laughs> we use it for ERP. Well, that's that's gen that's generally the conversation today, right? Uh, or I mean, that's generally what you're going to hear when it comes to uh, to that kind of stuff. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of kind of inclined to agree with that. I did manage a bunch of stuff. I don't teach the on stream. I'm not. I'm not worthy. <laughs> um, I teach enough. I used to. I, I was planning on teaching some C on stream, 
Uh, you gotta understand, I work with people as young as 10 years old. So when I teach something, I, I use a head-first approach. I am very, you know, meme-like. <laughs> I memeify my stuff. Uh, because it's more mnemonic and younger people can learn it a little bit better. Uh, I kind of straddle the fence between being a technologist and, a, and an educator and a writer and a communicator. So so that's where I, I kind of live my life. Uh, people like Dennis, who are like really, I mean, he has a lot of really interesting thoughts on on art as well. I've, I've watched him watching some movies and just having some great insights into them. But but in terms of the technologist, he's like, you know, hardcore <laughs> kind of guy on that. And I, I, I see that and I recognize that in others. And I'm like, well, I'm my strengths are communication and writing and, you know, the Read Me world, uh, which I would love you guys to help us with uh, spreading the word about the Read Me world as we get it going. Uh, kind of an alternative to the World Wide Web we've been forced to use right now. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, yeah, Oracle Rack and the whole web stack was bought bought from Sun, who bought from Netscape. Yep. I don't. <clears throat> did Oracle? Oracle did buy Netscape. That's right. That's why they have the JavaScript. They have the JavaScript trademark now too. I see Spark and think of yes. Uh, Fujitsu owns Spark also. Yep. They use the VS 200 mainframes. I think. Yep. Uh, I think it, I think it poured in the early 2000s. Do I teach C? Uh, kind of answer that one. Unix is a toy. Uh, the big companies use mainframes and ZOS. You know what? Uh, I'm not going to say bad stuff about that because I sat next to a guy when I was Nike's webmaster, uh, internet webmaster. And there was a guy, it was a mainframe guy. This is another story. Uh, there was a mainframe guy that was sat right next to me and, you know, total boomer, great guy, loved him to death. One of the best guys who come over and he was taking care of his mom and all kind of thing. And, um, he would come over. He, I kid you not. I was, I was like, I was a, an arrogant 20 or something, you know, and you know, I was running the, the, the thing and, and he come over, he goes, you know, we got, we got Linux, we got Linux on the mainframe now. And I think he told me that in probably, I want to say 90, what was that? Yeah, that would have been 90. Yeah. 97, 96, 97. Uh, are, are another place I have a lot of experience with giving a work on the port of the Unix to IBM Z series back in 2008. Yes, uh, and that's that's what my friend was telling me about is that they had already they'd already had Linux running uh, in LPARs and partitions on the mainframe, and so they were doing. This is the thing that I, just drives me crazy. Uh, you know, IBM was doing like you know virtual machines. They invented hypervisor, uh, and they were doing all that stuff before VMware got a hold of it and made all the money and got famous for it. I'm still running a Fujitsu Oracle servers and a number of companies running prod physical processors, six virtual processors. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. In the seventies they, they did that. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, most of the stuff inside SCO and Oracle Solaris and FreeBSD still have this. <clears throat> I want to see that. Let's see here. What we got? Uh, unpublished proprietary source of ATT. I was actually just looking at uh, samples of, of copyright notices the other day because I was putting one in a shell script I'm writing. Um, yeah, look at that. Look at that, man. Let me see if I can zoom in on this. We're just having fun. It's Friday. Just fun fact Friday. Um, uh, let's see here. If dev pragma, pragma, good old pragmas. See, I'm so... This is one thing about C that I'm so happy that the that the LLVM languages and Go have kind of moved away from is the compilation. In fact, Pike makes a joke about it, whether you like them or not. What do you think of Pike and the and the and the and the AT and T refugees, as Brian Kentrell calls them, Dennis? I'm just, I'd really love to hear your opinion on. It. I should probably ask you on stream sometime so you can you know fully respond if you want. <laughs> so I, I'm all the all the guys who, who jumped ship and went to went to Google. I think I think most of them are still out there at Google. Uh, any, yeah. Well, I have some ranting opinions on that. <laughs> I would, I, that's see, that would tune in for that. I need to know when that was going to come because because you know I actually re highly respect Pike and 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 Thompson and um, Greisimer. Greisimer's not on the project anymore for the Go project. I've since moved on, kind of to to Rust. <laughs> Let's set that aside after one or four beers. Yeah. So yeah, but but the reason I was reminded of it is because. Uh, I have learned so much about events. Yeah, yeah. Dude, oh God, our joint stream would be like a problem. <laughs> the thing, the, I the, okay. So can I just say something else I like about Mr. Dennis Last Miles? Uh, is that he he comes from he comes. 
I don't know how to, Dennis, I don't mean this to sound offensive. I'm just going to blurt it out. Okay. You do love Go and I'm looking into having a port and have ported it a few times. Nice. Uh, so what, I, what I, I'm going to say here. So this is a thing on my stream that happens a lot. Uh, it, it seems to me like people that are, you know, in the up and coming, intelligent, wonderful generations uh, are a little bit less inclined to, to fight. <laughs> And, you know, and, and to rant and to hate on things. And I actually just had to do a fun video the other day about hating on the word hate. You know, hate just means extreme dislike. It doesn't mean evil and stuff. Anyway, uh, I, I, I'm kind of overreaching here. But but Dennis strikes me as the kind of guy. Yeah. as that I mean, you take it out of context. That, that statement sounds weird, right, Mac? But Dennis strikes me as the kind of guy that I kind of grew up with. Uh, who they you know again no shits to give no no fucks to given they they will they will fight you about a topic and they'll have really strong opinions but you don't ever question the fact that they're you know that they're good people you know what i mean you don't ever yeah yeah or, or politically correct bullshit i don't do that yeah and you know see this is this is the thing i like about that and the, re the only reason i'm bringing this up is if, if if anybody from my stream goes and watches last miles and because sometimes i dennis i'm gonna have to just tell you straight up uh, occasionally i haven't rated you because I, i've got you know young people and i don't want to run into a last miles rant with all those guys and they you know it's like you know they accept the m rating and i've gone back and forth with you know, m and, and a non-m rating on my own channel a lot of times but the but the reason i bring that up at all is because because it's i kind of miss it i miss i miss the ability to state your opinion and not have to sort of backpedal off of your opinion you know uh because everybody around you might end up getting getting offended and getting pissed off and then reporting you or something like that and i'm not talking about inappropriate things obviously there's a boundary there but but disagreeing with somebody uh and you know um and, and i'm gonna i'm gonna say something that is gonna be in trouble but i've had really really close friends who I absolutely know appreciate me and call me a moron to my face. That's moron. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. You're a moron. And they'll say it to my face with a smile. And I absolutely know that I'm in good standing with them. Uh, we actually had one guy put his hand through the wall during a design meeting. And um, so anyway, that, that, uh, uh, when you have facts to spit it, to spit out, do it. Yeah, there is, there is a downside to that. And let me just say this. So, uh, there are lots of people that came from that generation and my generation and or, or that I, it's not even really a generational thing. It's just a, just a way of, of communicating and being, uh, who think it's okay to get louder. They think it's okay to get louder, to make their point, the louder they get their, that'll make them their point better. And I don't think they do it on purpose. Getting louder doesn't make your point more valid, <laughs> right? It's just like, it's like whoever's loudest wins right now. That that's stupid. Uh, I hope open bugger will be free BSD and I plan to push into production. Nice. Got the installer and the key uh, a time metadata within the file system and I have ran it on it hard. There's nothing wrong with venting and then with intelligence and experience is simply saying the truth may hurt. <laughs> and too mad if you don't like the color of the wallpaper or my tone. The message is the message. And oh, I'm gonna quote you on that. You you are going in my quotes list last miles. The message is the message. I got to put that on my quotes list. Where's my quotes list? Uh, because, you know, that's like, that is, you know, people can't separate the message and the truth from the from the person who's saying it. So it's kind of the opposite. So you have last miles telling people the message is the message. And then you have my mom telling me, nobody cares how much you know until you, they know how much you care. <laughs> so there's like something in the middle there, right? Yeah. If you shout it out, it has to be right. Yeah. The Me Too version sucked. I you know i don't i'm not i'm not gonna speak about that but uh so oh there's this there's a solaris oh the movie that's a different one i think i know what you're talking about i want to get this quote in here the message is the message from dennis last miles uh uh because i i really love that um so yeah the message is the message and you know that's i think we need that more i really do i we need we need to be respectful, and I think even Linus Torvalds agrees with that. You know, and he's very opinionated. Uh, but you get my point. Go ahead and close that quote up. Uh, all right, back to what we're doing. I want to look at the C code some more. Uh, so those of you who don't know what C code is, this is it. This is what C code looks like. Uh, and you know, uh, the reason I, I brought up Bob Rob Pike and the the uh, you know the at t refugees is because one of the reasons they they make a joke saying that the idea for go 
uh, came while they were waiting 20 hours for their code to go to compile. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, the, the, yeah, let's just be real. The guy, you know, practically, his story, I mean, the, the write up about how they, you know, sort of altered Unicode, he and Thompson altered Unicode on a napkin. Uh, oh, and it, when they got a hold of it from IBM, and then uh, it became the standard. And so, you know, every time you guys use an emoji, you know, you can partially thank Rob Pike, not just for the Go language, uh, you know, but for all of that. And, and he's written his own operating systems. Uh, so we, people, ask, I mean, I, I love Go. There's, I'm, I'm kind of souring on Go lately because of the whole generics thing. I, I just do not like. It almost feels like the Go project is getting is getting sort of derailed from its original. Uh, direction and it's starting to do weird things now that, that I don't think the original creators might have agreed with, but I could be completely wrong on that. Uh, Go Evangelist no more. I No, I still love Go. Go's got a lot of really direct usage. Uh, it's just it's, recently some of the design decisions that are happening that over there are not uh, are not as compelling. I mean, I'm, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, so my last discussion about political Christmas was the main branch and Git shouldn't be called master. Well, I don't know if that solves any real world problems. Yeah, that's true. That's a good one. Uh, my concern is that we have a generation that is being brain damaged by a political correct worldview, and they are losing the ability to disagree. Can I just, uh, amen, brother, if I had like a button to press, you know, that would cheer for that statement, I, I fear a bovine approach with people who won't speak up. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so look, we're not telling you, Dennis and I are not, I don't think we're telling everybody to go be an asshole. The world would be a better place. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is learn how to have respectful disagreements. Learn how to attack bad ideas and bad tech voraciously. That's what we need. We need more attacks, not less, because the best debate, the, the best ideas, the best tech will surface. The problem is you got to make sure you do that without attacking the person. And that's damn hard. That's really damn hard because we get really married to our ideas. I do. I know I do. You know, it's like somebody challenges a technology that I have, you know, researched for hours and hours and hours and come to a conclusion that took me hours and hours and hours to make. And now you're telling me my conclusion was false, that all that time was wasted. So all my cognitive dissonance kicks in to protect me from thinking that I was wrong. And then that feels like you got punched in the nose. <laughs> and then you react. And then you react and you have a big old fight. Learn to debate instead of instead of the literal Nazi club. Yeah. Especially when you're getting paid by a corporation. Yeah, I, have, I, I see I have code laying, laying about that goes back to 1984. <laughs> oh, I want to see that one too. Oh, look at that. 1984, some microsystems, yep. Wow, that is so cool. I mean, yeah, you could you could uh, always always avoid ad hominem, yeah, and that's hard. It's definitely hard to do that. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard. It's particularly hard when somebody's disagreement with you is uh, either religious or you know about something like that where there's you know, people's lives in, in jeopardy. Uh, political correctness and snowflakery is a problem. Uh, that I hear that GitHub is now changing the master runs. Yes, that's true. They're doing that. And um, I want to be careful here because I'm not, you know, the, okay, let's look at the intent. You know what I'm saying? Let's look at the intent here. So if, if we can avoid, if we can avoid a master slave reference in anything, I'm good with that. You know, there's an entire Linux distro created just to avoid the word kill. <laughs> And Damon there. I'm not kidding. Go. It's like, go look it up. I'm not going to even talk about the name. There's actually, yes, we have yeah, shellcheck.net. It's really nice. Yes. Did you just find that? I, I actually posted a uh, reference to that earlier. Um, this is C code still on the screen, by the way, in case you guys are wondering, because we have last miles visiting. Um, but, but yeah, after a uh, few beers, I may get a, get a bit loose on what, on that, but I, but I earned the right over five decades of work, work, work to rant a little. Yeah. And, and you know, that's, you know what, that's ultimately, that's just the more, the more objective experience you bring to a conclusion the more weighty that conclusion the stronger the opinion and the more validated that opinion should be uh you know there's there's a saying that i've heard about in silicon valley that i don't that that gets bantered back and forth called strong opinions weakly held and and i i've wrote about i've written about this and i actually really believe it um a strong opinion is not just an opinion that 
that you feel strongly about it's, it, it the idea is is that the strong opinion is an opinion that you have a lot of experience with that you've put through the scientific method that you've engaged with debate uh, you know healthy respectful debate with people about it and you really believe it because you have a lot of evidence to suggest that it's true uh, weekly held however means that in the light of new information you change your opinion and it's funny because we started streaming about this thing and this I get it, I get accused of flip flopping all the time uh, because I when I get new evidence uh, about a thing I change my opinion and and pretty pretty quickly actually uh, so anyway yeah so yeah if you have experience and you have you know now I think Dennis will admit as well that we sometimes can become married to our opinions and our ideas and then we become dogmatic about them at least I'm not saying you are but I I have done that too where you like that nice pretty uh you know let's 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 talk about one so uh quantum <laughs> you know like the like the Higgs boson discoveries right and they they didn't find supersymmetry, right? It's this beautiful idea. Uh, this has to be true. Supersymmetry is so awesome. It has to be true. And and they're so married and dogmatic to that scientific idea that when the atomic weight of the Higgs boson didn't didn't prove that, that supersymmetry was true, nor did it prove that the alternative, this sort of chaos uh, approach was true, that they got you know kind of triggered because hey, it, my beautiful theory and opinion that I spent my whole life making has to be true <laughs> so yeah yeah what internet were they removed from the blacklist oh not related to people of color it's way older yeah master yeah master slave yeah well there I mean come on what are we gonna do disk drives master and slaves right how many of you have, have, have installed your own hard drives you have like yeah like what back in the old IDE days I you know hard drives you have a master hard drive and then you have the slave hard drives that's the what they're called. We're not going to change that. And again, I have all of the compassion and empathy that I possibly can have as an old white guy. I don't even want to say anything because I, because I'm already, you know, in a position to not even begin to understand it. So I, I am not making a comment on what's going on right now. I'm just stating that th that word specifically uh, doesn't come from slavery, right? It it was used in slavery, but but it does that terminology is does not or originate in slavery. Um, just like the word daemon uh, doesn't originate in occult devil worship. <laughs> I mean, come on. The Berkeley mascot is a little demon. <laughs> so I can't we must make a different Unix. Uh, right? <laughs> Dennis, you're a devil worshiper because you're a BSD guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know. Pretty good, yeah. Hard disk, those newfangled things. <laughs> oh, you win! <laughs> Dennis wins the cool hipster war for using IBM 65, 6250BPI tapes for storage. The closest I got to that was writing an automated system to manage uh, to manage our tape of our Tivoli tape devices, and I would go change out the tapes. You guys haven't lived until you've seen a tape device machine. We got to find one. Uh, let's see if I can find a video of one. You got, I mean, these, these, these people, <laughs> these people, you guys have become these people. Uh, they have no idea what tape storage is about. I mean, cause I don't think, I don't think it's a thing anymore. Right. Oh yeah. Here we go. <laughs> of course. Let's look at that face. That's pretty much. <laughs> I love Linus Does Tech, and that's the perfect reaction from somebody today that you show you show a tape device to. <laughs> like, what? Uh, he's pretty funny. Anyway, I, I like watching him too. He's pretty he's pretty funny. Uh, before A drives, oh god. So I mean, it's it's random Friday. If you don't like it, <laughs> go away. <laughs> We're having fun. Say first basic programs in high school on paper tapes. Yes. We talked about that before. I loaded from a cassette on an Atari 400. I know I'm not. This is this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what my my actually my grandfather ran off actual tapes. You know the large tapes. This is back when you had computer operators. You weren't allowed to touch a computer. You had to put your program on uh, on cards, 
in the incoming slot. You couldn't even go in the room with the computer and they would take the cards on the other side and if you're really lucky, they would run your program. <laughs> they would actually run it once and give you the output on a piece of paper. You'd have to go back and check it all out. Tapes, you got a good one? Oh, that's, that's exactly what I was talking about. That's exactly what I was talking about right there, man. This is my grandpa I use these things. This looks like it looks like it looks like straight out of a Star Trek episode. <laughs> everybody, everybody on Twitch has been showing all these Star Trek stuff. Remember, we had to run the tape back in the beginning before you deliver the tape back to the dealership. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Uh, I think German pension insurance still uses tape storage. Yeah, we well, used to use five and a quarter floppies for our nuclear arsenal. Thank God, because nobody can hack it. Long-term story tapes are still in use. Yes, they totally are. Uh, and they will be for a long time, right? Uh, anybody ever play around with microfiche? It's a different technology, but I used to do genealogy a lot when I was Mormon. Another story for another day. Uh, but you ever play around with microfiche? Microfiche are freaking amazing. I mean, it's so cool. It's like they figured out a way to shrink down. It's like pre-silicon days. They figured out a way to shrink down plastic to microscopic sizes. And you like you like move around the, micros the microscope to read it. Uh, but if you if you go back and look at like any old newspaper, uh, it's not digital, of course. So we're not, we're not we're talking about it's a different not a, it's not a computer technology, but it was, you know, one of the technologies of the day that I just find really fascinating from like you know like you know, 50s tech, you know. So yeah, it's, you did operate those. Yeah, let's see if we can find. Um, I want to see if I can I can actually find a. Well, those were still. Uh, let's see. Well, those were still in use on IBM 3090 MSA ESA systems. I sometimes had to pick up the untold lengths of it when the air tunnel feed got screwed up. You had to open the door and it all spilled over the floor and then you had to carefully rewind the tape. Oh my God. <laughs> Refeed it. I feel your pain, my friend. Oh no, we're going to have Chris over here too? What the heck? Well, we, we can't plan on doing anything productive if Chris comes over. <laughs> Seriously, that's like... So let's talk, I mean, tapes, guys, tapes. So here's here's modern tape drives. So modern, uh, so modern, yeah. Modern, modern, it's funny because we're like geeking out, but we're also talking about the old stuff. Modern, modern tape drives. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, uh, the Tivoli, that was on the Tivoli team. This is before, IBM bought the Tivoli company and it had such a good brand. They, they, they put the name Tivoli on everything. <laughs> It was it was everywhere. And so if somebody said Tivoli, they said, that, "Oh, how's it going?" They would say, "They would say, hey, this is we're using Tivoli. We're Tivoli. I'm like, what? Are you talking about Tivoli Storage Manager? Are you talking about Tivoli Orchestration? Tivoli what? Tivoli what? Tivoli Rational Rows that they bought. So they put the word Tivoli on everything. And I was actually on the Tivoli team at the end there. How's it going, guys? If the Raiders are here, welcome Raiders. Uh, Dennis and I are just geeking out a little bit. Hey, Chris, I got a question for you. Don't you leave. Without me letting you ask a question, uh, I have, a, I have a, a question I want to ask of another seasoned Linux user. But uh, all the Raiders coming over, I'm super happy to share that um, Dennis Last Miles uh, is here in the audience. Uh, you, <laughs> screw TSM, you say, Joe. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. And so, so we've been talking about some of this. We've just been geeking out and talking about old stuff. Uh, we were talking about some C in the day. Uh, uh, we were talking about, uh, yeah, welcome Raiders. We were talking about, um, so the last thing we were just showing is good old tape drives. I guess it's Friday. It's totally, you know, random Friday. We're just having fun. And uh, for some reason, we just started geeking out about, about tape drives. And and we're looking at that. I mean, check it out, guys. That's like, yeah, you have to like take those tapes in and out. <laughs> right? It's fun day. Yes. Uh, s some people... Uh, some people still use it to, to for backup more reliably they claim yeah uh, i had a client that used the tape for 10 years seriously yeah no he actually dennis was right saying he was writing some tape systems like you know to use the tape drives and i'm i'm like i, I wrote the software that would like some not software i wrote some some scripts let's say uh that would do some of the automated tape transfers and thing uh yeah Oh, modern tape systems are pretty reliable. Yeah, so it's the Mr. Robot thing. You guys know about this Mr. Robot scene where he he creates a plan and he melts all the tapes in the thing because he says the emollient level on the tape is like uh, over 80 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. 
Do you guys remember this this scene? He makes a little raspberry pie and he he puts he goes in the bathroom and puts it on the he, he puts it, I'm you know spoiler alert you know he puts it in, he connects it into the to the climate system and um and like one of these stone mountain kind of tape storage places. If you're gonna be, if you're a noob and you're watching this guy, what the hell is tape? So this is what tape is good for and what it's still being used for apparently. Uh, so tape tape is the way to do long term storage that almost costs nothing. Right. Um, so what they do is they'll put all the ones and zeros on analog. You know, this is still I guess it's technically it's digital and they'll write it all on a, on a tape. Usually the tape doesn't like it's not big like these old ones, but it's more like the one that was in that Linus video here like this. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that I use to to handle. And and then you, you have to swap out these tapes pretty regularly to take backups of like enterprise data and, um, you know, insurance companies stuff like that. And then they would take these tapes and they would load them into an armored car uh raid five oh god and they would take him into an ar armored car and then they would go and they would put them in the in the cliff somewhere you know in solid granite carved out places and then that's how they do backup and they still do that today apparently so people were saying about that uh so if you're a system administrator and that's the term that people used to use before it got all pejorative and shot down by google saying oh we don't do system administrator we call them site reliability engineers you know i that triggers me, obviously, the way I'm saying it. Mr. Robot, I thought Elliot was trying to overheat the UPS to cause the data backup sites to burn down. No, he was trying to raise, that's a misconception. <laughs> he was trying to raise the heat level. Actually, he does a little demonstration where he drops the tape on top of the burner at the arcade. You guys remember that scene? Uh, because if you get the tape hot, hot enough, it'll just melt. Uh, and yeah, uh, raid, raid 10 is the only true raid. Oh God. <laughs> oh, another, another one. Uh, yeah, stuff like the the quantum and tape storage, they'll steal backup tape drives. Yes. Oh gosh, I'm gonna pull that one up too. But I'm gonna. I don't want to lose these. So let me. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly. We used to script these things. That's the sun one. Oh my god, that is the sun. You have one. This is in your house. Wait, are you taking pictures from your house? <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah, that is definitely yours. Look at that thing. Oh man, that is so, that brings me back so, oh, Sunmate, uh, you know what, I gotta tell you, just taken just now, you, ugh. okay, so I, I want to be independently wealthy, <laughs> so, so that I can buy like old Sun hardware, and because I, when I see the Sun logo, you have no idea, it's like, like, it like sends me back to this time when I first discovered Unix, you know, and, and I was I was working with these these absolute awesome awesome dudes in Portland, Oregon. Joey, Joey, if you are out there, my man, thank you so much for entering my life. I mean, I actually got a chance to work with these guys, Skizix, if you're there, you know. And and they 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 didn't really take me under the wing. That is not the way to say it. <laughs> they pretty much you know beat me up and asked dumb questions and like well like like. Man, I wish I could have Solaris at home. Dude, just get Linux. <laughs> so I actually did. I installed Mock Linux. Some of you in the audience might actually know what that is. I actually installed Mock Linux on an IBM Power PC, and I know Dennis knows what that is. <laughs> it was back in the RISC days when Max had RISC chips, and IBM and, and Apple had that like awkward relationship for how many years? You guys remember that? Am I still streaming? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You guys remember that? I kind of want to take... You have that running? Really? Wow. That's so funny. Here we go. There's some more tape drives. Let's see if we can find here. Um, Quantum. Security reliability. Yeah. Yep. There it is. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. So here we go. We have a quantum computer, long-term data storage, so you don't need for a dependable, efficient way. Um, let's help. No one can ignore data protection. This is this is like straight out of Mr. Robot. Um, you know, it's like yeah. There's your. This is a device, though. Yep. Stock security footage. <laughs> I have a good HDDs. Lasts about twenty years, and reasonable I/O even. Yeah. Does anybody know what the lifetime is of a CD? I, I've, I've often wondered that. I put a lot of stuff on CDs. Must have the stock, the stock stuff. Yeah, right. 
So these these things are so cool. Um, Ten years is the rate of life for a CD-ROM. Hey, fun fact for the noobs out there, uh, and I say that with the greatest of affection for you. Uh, guess where tar command comes from? Since we're talking about tape, let's do a little bit of educational thing. Anybody out there? Is it, today's the first day that they learned? Today I learned about tar. Yep, there you go. Tar, we can thank all this old tape architecture for the tar utility because that's what it was made for. Yep, tape archives. Uh, and we still to this day, we use it, and which is funny because, you know, you got you got Java jar files, which are sort of influenced by tar. So you can trace the, you know, you can trace trace it all the way back from the, the first time people started using tape you know, all the way up until you got jar files. Uh uh, and it wasn't a lot of compression. Uh, does anybody know? Does anybody? Well, last month, I wonder if you know. Oh, red staple at scale. Wait, wait, wait. Oh God. <laughs> I might have to save this picture just because I, because I, it'll be the, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be proof the last month's actually. Holy cow! He put me on his. Look at those sun thing. I. Can't. I'm so jealous. So let me finish that thought. The Sun logo makes me have like warm fuzzies. <laughs> I feel so good just looking at the Sun logo. It's like it's like going home, you know, for school uh, after being you know, going to your favorite, you know, swimming hole. <laughs> when I see the Sun logo, oh man, it just makes me so happy. It just like washes over me because I remember learning. I, I okay, I'm gonna share something here. It's a little bit. This is a little bit. I need to get a sun tattoo. I know, I know. So, you know, it, it, people just like it's got too much baggage now. That's unfortunate, but it's true. So, sun is cool. They invented Java. Don't get me started on that. Largest marketing campaign for a language in history: five hundred thousand dollars. Was in fact, go read about that. It's pretty amazing. Java is like, I'm pretty sure it's the only language that had a massive, massive. Uh, Scott Manelli, always trolling Bill Gates. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. That was what was happening. So you guys don't know who that is. Bill Gates started Microsoft. <laughs> Some of the people watching might not even know that at this point. Uh, you know, there'll come a time when people will not, not, well, they not only know what Sun is, they don't even know who Bill Gates is, let alone Scott McNeely. Yeah. Every time I see a Sun logo, I feel an urge to punch someone in the face. <laughs> oh God. That's funny. When I get a sun component, I'm going to paint it tan, and then it's then it's a sun. Ha ha. Oh my god. <laughs> no, it's like the reason I have such good feelings about it, and that sounds really weird, but is it's like I used to look forward to going into work. Because you couldn't use Linux at home. You couldn't use Unix at home. Guys, guys. So 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 imagine a world. Uh I'm a professional poker <laughs> dad joker. So, I can run. Yes, please do. Last miles. Well, uh, Scott Stock took build the court and he won. Yes, he did because of the Java disaster when MS broke Java on purpose to protect the Windows desktop. Old school Microsoft, no doubt about that. That is definitely going to be a fun one to hear about. Uh, but I just so I, I kind of want people to 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 just stop and take note of how awesome they have it in the '90s, which is only 20 years ago, right? In, in the 90s, obviously, Dennis had access. He had privileged access. Thank God I hate him because he had so much access to Unix early on. And that's my point. There were times when if you went to college, you got excited to go into college and use Unix. Because why? Because it was the only time you were going to get to use Unix. This is why Sun exploded onto the scene. Sun exploded onto the scene because there was this pent up, oh, please, 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 can I use Unix? You know, and if you're lucky... 30 years ago that's true well i'm thinking 90 uh, you know what to be fair when i say 90s i always mean like 96 so you're absolutely right my math is off um but but yeah so it, it was just yesterday i know dennis is like it, it's my, my but the point i try to make is, is that when how's it going alexander uh alexander mikhail ruski gavarashi uh, but Solaris zones for university e-learning platform 15 years ago. Solaris still rocks. It does. And so 
you know, but, but, but the reason I'm talking about this is there may be some people who don't understand. They're Linux people, right? I don't think you understand how monumentally huge Linux was for us. The, the, I spent, I don't know how many hours trying to get Linux, which is really what I thought was just Unix, trying to get Unix to run on my Mac, Power Mac, you know, on my, not a Power Mac. It was, uh, you know, it was a, yeah, it was a Power Mac. No, it was back, I don't even remember what it was called. It had the mock kernel. So, you know, and only because I wanted a command line. I just wanted a command line. You could not get a, okay, I'm going to calm down now. I'm going to calm down and I'm going to take some coffee to calm down, but I'm going to make a point here. And it's gonna it's gonna sound like I'm uh, I'm the old guy telling you should appreciate your blah blah blah. And I don't care. So there was a time that I lived through where not only could you not use a computer, you could not use a command line. You couldn't. You know. And then there was a time where you had to use a command line, which is really funny. So so yeah, you could you definitely couldn't use Sun if you wanted to use a true Unix system. You had to be a privileged person who was in a university uh, or you had to be going to a university that was lucky enough to have one of the big systems like Berkeley. Uh, and I wasn't. Uh, or, or you know, wh when I got to go to work and I got to sit at a Sun workstation, just like the ones that Last Miles was using, when I got to sit at a Sun workstation, I would get giddy. I would get physically giddy. <laughs> I would get physically giddy. Uh, the tape drives are so expensive here in Australia. What? Really? Uh, Linux brought Unix like to you for free. We get it. Okay. I know. You're like done with me saying anything more about it. But I, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And I don't think other people sometimes understand how big a deal it was. So there. Come on. How dare you forget the glorious days of MS DOS? <sighs> Did you know that DOS stands for Dirty Operating System? That's the actual original name. Mm-hmm. Yep. Go look that up. Uh, that's uh, the reference for that is um, Triumph of the Nerds. Yeah, great documentary. Everybody should watch it. It's free on YouTube. Set in the '80s. Talks about the PC invent, uh, the inv advent of the PC. Goes through the whole Silicon Graphics days as well. Uh, I'm done when hearing older people cheering about Linux. Seriously, you being you. <laughs> Gates brought Gates bought it. Disk operating system. It, well, I, I don't know. It wasn't disk. It wasn't disk operating system. Originally, it was it was dirty. QDOS was the original quick and dirty. Oh, I think you might be right. Chris has got me on that one. Yeah. Hey, Chris, while you're here, since I, since you're here, let me ask you a question before you guys take a break, because we all need to take a break. And I mean, I'm, well, I'll be here all day. No, but I I love taking. I I just need to know when to raid you guys. Uh, QDOS is, and, and and the amazing kill there. Yes. That's right. And if you guys don't know what that is, please, please, please watch Triumph of the Nerds. You can go watch it for free. Uh, Brenchley, uh, Peter Brenchley, which is his writer name. Gary Kildall, yes. Yep, the one who got totally roasted. Uh, if, if you want to see what actually happened to this guy, actually, we can watch this. This is not, this is not bad. I'm going to turn down my music for just a second. Uh, this is like mandatory viewing pretty much. Uh, Triumph of the Nerds on, uh, here it is, impressing their friends. Uh, th there's a, there's, I'm trying to find a segment on Gary Kildall, but this is, um, it's a three part series. It's just really, really cool. Uh, you're fetching a beer. <laughs> I might have to actually do that myself, but, but so yeah, I mean, guys take it if you need to take a break or something. So I'm going to find the YouTube copy just cause. Uh, let's see. Part of the Transcenters Part One, Vimeo. Um, Transcenters Part One, The Rise of the Accidental. So, if you want to understand what happened during how PCs came to be, it's a really entertaining uh, documentary about it. Uh, back in the day, yeah, it's like all all four by nine or whatever. I'll stream it a bit, yeah, because I need to go. <laughs> I need to go get stuff ready for work and stuff, but. Telling you this at a basketball game? Well, I like the game, but mainly it's because of that guy down there. That guy down there. That's not. That's the other guy who got rich. His name is Paul Allen. Four, four by three. Thanks. Belongs to him. <laughs> the Portland Trailblazers Don't go. basketball team, their arena, even the dancers. Basketball courts are the places former IBM execs go. I mean, former Microsoft execs go to 
20 years ago, Alan and his high school friend Bill Gates were running a two-man software company called Microsoft. <laughs> what? What's up with that, Haney? You guys are always Today, like... Alan is richer than God, and Gates you found it? Than Good, Alan. yeah. Gabe Newell also wrote to the Kobe fan. Yes, it's true. Yep, Gabe is, a, Gabe is definitely a Microsoft royalty. To believe that 20 years yeah. ago there were no personal computers. <laughs> now it's the third largest industry in the world, somewhere between energy production and illegal drugs. And illegal drugs. The most amazing thing of all is that it happened by accident. It happened by accident. So, uh, there's another one. Actually, there's another. There's another nerd's video. Uh, there's another nerd's video documentary if you want to watch it. That um, it's called Triumph of the Nerds 2, uh, and that's the one that goes all through Sun Microsystems and 3Com and. All the, all the creation of Ethernet and um, uh, also, which all came from Palo Alto, uh, which is kind of an interesting fact, fun fact. Uh, some of you guys might not know this, but uh, so Palo Alto Research Labs, which was buried inside of Xerox that Xerox really did never appreciate properly, uh, they invented object oriented programming. Uh, they invented the graphic user interface. They actually didn't. They watched Heng Engelbart about that and they got it from a lot of those guys in Palo Alto saw the, the, the mother of all demos. And I'm, I'm going to show you some other mandatory viewing. Uh, the mother of all demos. Uh, this is where the mouse was invented. And if you want to read the whole story of this, uh, there's a there's a book called The Innovators uh, by the same guy who did the um, the biography of uh, of Steve Jobs. 1968, one year after I was born. Uh, as I give away my age there, it's pretty long. Uh, it's kind of funny because this was back in the time where people were singing hymns at IBM and. People were doing the work, and people like Engelbart were getting the credit <laughs> back in those days. He did it. To us. Who invented it then, Ramingu? Am I wrong again? So you know, because people say Chuck Norris <laughs> he invented a copy and paste marking text. This is true. Yeah. Oh, I see. I and the graphic like user interface, right, with mouse. That our computer supplies. So nowadays to do the Brits did. On here. Interesting. So this characterizes the way I could sit here. And Xerox did not invent it. Piece of paper. Are you saying okay? Xerox didn't invent it. No, that would, that's what I'm talking about. The Palo, That's actually a misconception that I had. And if you know something other than that, let me know. Uh, for the radar systems, okay. Yeah, Xerox actually. So this is actually one of the most common misconceptions. I didn't learn the right answer to this till my 40s. Uh, and for the longest time, I thought the Palo Alto Xerox lab was where the mouse was invented. Turns out those people saw Engelbart. They learned about the mouse from other places and they just implemented it. They just implemented it. They're the first to really get popularity implemented. Of course, that's what Steve Jobs said he saw. And that's in that video, by the way. Uh, and, and he said that he had seen it. Um, Media Wiki computer, computer mouse. Really? You're going to give me a Wikipedia? We have a visitor. Who is here? What are you bringing me? Snacks. You're bringing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I guess I got my. I can watch this thing and turn the sound down. So, so we're not going to watch the whole thing. That's a but good start. I'll sit here and say I'd like to load that in. So. All right. Very sorry about that. Sorry about that. I love the noises. The noises are my favorite part. <laughs> So I'm putting in an entity called a statement. I'm putting in an entity called, called a words. statement. 1960 set, guys. Yeah, if you got to go to lunch, go take off. Hey, Chris, I just wanted to ask you one thing. So maybe can you just put a thumbtack in this? I'll so just tell you right now because I'm going to go eat too. Um, uh, we, we're, we're, doing, we're kind of doing a comparison versus um, WSL and starting out with a virtual machine. And I think I've all but decided that starting out beginners with a virtual machine is the right way to go because it's going to be a consistent experience when they put it on hardware, uh, if they have the horsepower to do so. Uh, we pretty much concluded that, but I wanted to see what your take was on that. Um, if you think that VM is way better. Okay, that's all. I, I, I thought maybe you would agree with that, but I just kind of wanted to get your input on that because I know uh, there is no system D. Ooh, that's, I thought about that too. Um, and WS, but CWSL... You know, I don't know. Uh, the main, I'm, the, the shallow reason I'm having particularly young beginners do this uh, uh, is a correct way to proceed. <laughs> not uh, not WSL. All right. Well, wow. There's overwhelming uh, consensus on that point. So I appreciate that. Uh, 
Yeah, just compiling Hugo takes forever for a simple task. That's true too in WSL. This is true. And if they want to get into development and they want to do any like C and Rust or anything. So uh, well, there you have it. You have you have Chris and Dennis last miles all agreeing together. So uh, you know this 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 stream is done because <laughs> that was really all I wanted to find out. Uh, so status, uh, where did the mouse come from? Like that's gonna pull him in. Like I care. <laughs> Why screw Linux? <laughs> I oh, a sec, I I gotta quote you on that. I'm going to quote you again on that. All right. While well, he's talking, I have a, a statement with some entities words, and I can do some <laughs> operations on these. I fish. Engelbart and the fish. That word like copy after itself. In fact, that's yeah. Their words. I like For copy actual work. After itself. Yeah. I can just do this a few times. Right. And get a bit of uh, material there. And there are other entities like text. Say after there, I'd like to copy from that entity point to that. Go point, to VMware. Yep. And it'll copy it. Great. Yep. That's exactly so what I've been suggesting. I could get it feels good to have you. Material on my blank piece of paper. And then I'd say, well, this is going to be more important than it looks. So I'd like this to stuff. Go to VMware. ES uh, ESXi clusters. I wrote some pro code to integrate with the ESXi stuff. And it says, well, I need a name. Yep. I'll give it a name. The mouse yeah, from Park. Mouse. Okay, Dennis, you got to justify that because look at what well, he's about to use one. So help me understand. See, I used to think it was from Park Two, and I don't know if I agree. I I, I did for years until my forties. I thought it, but th there's a mouse right there in 1968. So you know, I didn't know about this. I didn't know about this 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 presentation until uh, probably 10, 15 years ago. And ever since then, I've been so like, I'm giving. A blank piece of paper yeah, take care, Chris. Thanks for the uh, file. This file insight there. Kimu 90% of the time, and then the other VM products. And yeah, and I actually want to work into having people use Kimu, but they got it. We're talking. I'm talking about beginners who don't know how to use Linux at all. I've never put it on anything, right? So I can look at that and say, hmm, probably goes off the screen. It'd be interesting if yeah. I could ask the computer to Somebody sent us the apps to show me just the first line of each of those statements. Oh god, I can't read anything. So it did. This is one aspect of what we'll use over and over again through this presentation. Um view control. Where is it? Where, Trackball. No matter where in the file we're Someone looking, sent me a URL. We can ask it to use any one of a large Who sent me the URL on the for constructing a computer mouse there it is. Point in the file that best suits our need at the time. Small distance to move the mouse. Some people move it over three meters. So I'll say, well, I have this. I don't want them all to be statement one. So I'll just replace the word there. With the um, How about that one with a three? Computer mouse history. I do not like the graphics. The graphics can bite me. So I can look and say, all right, that statement's one, two, three, and four. If I'd like to make them a little prettier, all right. I can... Uh, Oh, ball tracker. This this guy. Yeah, the trackball related pointing device was invented in 1946. Really? Who would have guessed that Wikipedia had something? I hope you can tell. Yeah. All right. All right. So I can get it leaned up, lined up, and I can say, for instance, other entities like an invisible string. I don't food. know whether that's tabs or characters in there, but I can say if I want to and place that invisible, replace that invisible string with just one character. Here goes your cut and paste. Right here. That one. Space, and it'll do it. So I can look at that and say I have files, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I've named them that way. And then he goes home, honey, sort of a pain I have a way for you to do your shopping list. To number them themselves. <laughs> and one of the views is such that it will give you a list. We've come so far, guys. I mean, we've come so far. 1968. This is 1968. What blows me in my mind is they put people on the moon back then. In a file, create a file. I can delete that file or mess it up considerably. Like if I'm going to say I want to delete that word by accidentally hit that entity instead, watch what happens. Look, he's even doing transparency, picture in picture. This is the whole thing. There's nothing. You know how they did it? They had television cameras pointing to screens, and then they would combine the screens. It's crazy. They have... It's all analog. All of it's analog. Well, I'm through with this example right now. Let me go to a file that I prepared 
just after my wife called me and said, uh, and the way no, home, but this is, shopping for yeah. So as soon as she said that, I, uh, he I does sound like he's on the mood, doesn't he? <laughs> Let's see, from the article, the Xerox Alto was one of the first computers designed for individual use in 1973. It was the first modern computer to use a mouse. Okay, well, that's great to know. Thank you for that. So that was the first one that actually went into production. Yes, those are numbers, numbered statements. Uh, for GUI, for GUI, right. Yeah, Jobs gives him credit for that, for sure. But yeah, Palo Alto, they invented Ethernet. They invented object oriented programming. Um, when you're ready to go shopping, small talk, the small talk system, so let me and, um, and I can do things like begin to uh, at least they, well. you know, I'd be really yeah, interested to see if small talk is class based like object oriented programming and hear what Jim Copeland has to say about that. And so right because, anyway, aspirin doesn't really belong there. Uh, I think mostly this was on an Apple computer. Well, uh, it's ironic, Apple though. never got popular where I live. Yeah. I would begin to have a lot of trouble keeping that straight. I gotta tell you, I was just, I kind of was slow coming over to the Macintosh. Um, I liked, I liked Word Perfect so much better than Word on a Mac. I didn't like all the graphic stuff. I never have. I mean, let me be real. Should I? Good night, guys. Yeah, we're just, I'm just eating lunch and watching old videos. Thank you for dropping by, everybody who's still here or wants to stay around. Hi there. Yeah. I, I suspect that something's going wrong. I would call Bye, the digital. Or the hardware man. <laughs> and tell him, I made it. <laughs> Produce. <laughs> I really haven't warmed up to this thing. Yet. Yeah, next step was I'll awesome. Say, Produce, I'll categorize yeah. things. Let me uh, yeah. look at it that way and I'll say, let me move It was 93, right? For Produce carrots. And I'd like to subcategorize it <laughs> so it moves. Yeah. You know how that went, right? Peter, you know how that whole went down, right? Yeah, go start a stream. Last Mouse, can I can I raid you? Go start one up and I'll raid you so I can go back to work. <laughs> I need to work. Yeah, we'll go raid you. I'd love to have you show them show him some stuff. Categorizing things like that. And if I looked at the numbers now, I'd find that these these items fit under there as a subset. Steve Jobs was asked to come back to Apple, but he said, I'm not coming back unless I can bring my next box. I, what I want to know, this is a thing I never, I've never gotten the story on. I need to read on it. I want to know how Steve Jobs figured out to steal BSD. I think he just copied Silicon Graphics. Or only one level deep in there. It makes it very yeah. nice for study. Yeah. Or I can do something like They like, did. Say, but I don't I want to know where they found out about BSD and where they got it. Open up one level below it and yeah. only show me. Next up had BSD in it. And then another level if I wish, and then no numbers. In fact so these you name jump to identity. You name on a on a on a Mac for a long time reported BSD. And then they changed it to Darwin. I don't know. I don't have any information on that. I wish I did. Well, suppose I work for some time at this and then yeah. I follow my wife to get the rest of the list. I'd eventually end up... I want to know how he figured out to do next step. What? I think... I have a feeling he saw Silicon Graphics because Silicon Graphics was, was just destroying it. They were all over the place for, as a workstation. And then... Uh, uh, and then what? You know, uh, they were destroying it as a workstation. How's it going, Mem Theory? Uh, that's my motto for today, Windows Background Services. Looks like duck and cover video. It kind of does. Back when, if you were a technologist, instead of having a beard and, a, you know, hipster glasses, <laughs> you had to have a tie and sock garters. I'm not lying. You would get in trouble for not wearing your sock garters at IBM. You don't look, you're, you're disrespecting the company. And you would sing hymns. IBM, Watson, men, partners of TJ. I should really just go eat this. Is last miles there so I can rate him? 
It'll go to a carrots. What fun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what fun to sell his products night and day. Hey, that's actually the lyrics. They were singing about selling IBM products and joyously. That's why we are so gay. Actual words. Go look it up. <laughs> the IBM hymn. There's like multiple IBM hymns you had to sing. Crazy man. <clears throat> who can we? Who can we? I guess. Uh, is he on? My stream title. Oh, there you are. Last miles. Um. Friday morning computer day. Okay, I'm gonna I'm already right now. I assume you're up, right? Are you on? This is all IRC, by the way, Dennis. If you wanna catch the IRC. Um. So okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you, I mean, if you haven't set up yet, if you have IRC set, you come in on the channel. Let me know, or somebody else. You can have a minion. Let me know, and I'll just I'll just raid. I actually I really do have to go get some stuff done, but it's been so much fun on this Friday. You know what? Maybe I'll venture out and get some whiskey. No, light beer for me. I hate that I have to drink light beer now. I hate getting old. Can I just say? Sucks. It's not fun. Yeah, I know. I can I can rate him. I don't think he's up yet. I can ask to see the name, or I can ask not to see the names. Depending on which, right now we happen not to be seeing. Vegan bots on too. Good for him. That's a guy to go watch too, guys. Go watch Vegan Bot too if you want to learn how to code and stuff. So look what else we can do in here. I know, I, I know, know Dennis. I know. For some reason, all of a sudden, I can't do alcohol. I almost had an anaphylactic shock last night from the wine. The I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> We can compare notes later, right? But there's another thing I, I get the sense that when you're one of these guys who's going to be like well preserved and live until they're 92 or <laughs> longer. Yeah, I was going to say if you guys if you guys want to go raid Vegan Bot, I'm going to raid Last Miles today. But go see. yeah, I know, I don't, know, I know, I know, I know. It's kind of funny. It's like I can't do alcohol. It sucks. It's like my it's like my my torture. You know, raised Mormon for 40 years, no alcohol. All of a sudden, I get to be 50. I can't do alcohol for much. I'll be like, George, I know. You're, 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 it's pretty obvious. You're going to be like, totally, totally. You know. I'm going to, I mean, I love me some, some whiskey or scotch. My favorite is actually, I'm going to, I'm going to admit, my favorite is cognac. Cognac is hands down my favorite. Uh, if you can't handle it, don't drink it. Well, I don't know. It's not about not handling it. I, 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 it's, it's a long story. Go for the raid. Raiders prepare. I'm actually going to interject instead of just doing my command here. Last miles. Oh, wait. Hey, last miles. Let me give you the, give you one. I don't know if you care for one, but if you want my little Twitch shrimp, you can rip apart. Uh, I'm sure you can get ideas out of there. If nothing more. Uh, so Twitch, uh, Another one, you, another one I think you probably would like. Uh, let me just give you this one too if you want. Um, and yeah, so and then I'm going to go ahead and do a Twitch raid. Uh, oh, of course, everybody who, who wants the fish, there's the fish. So those are the three things I generally get people when they come. And uh, Twitch raid, Mr. Last Miles. And I'm going to go ahead and kick it in gear. It, it has far too long of a, has far too long of a, of a cool down. The, on the rating thing it like makes me crazy but uh it's not as crazy as using a graphic interface <laughs> so um uh, here it comes 83 viewers raid now bye <laughs>